My uh, great-grandfather was the first. He was Michael Manning, a uh, tenant farmer who was dispossessed or gave up in the famine, came to New York. When Michael Manning landed at South Street in 1847, the first person who saw him was probably horrified. I think with the way he probably dressed and um, what he represented. People weren't saying, oh, here's a wonderful immigrant. Let's bring him in. He's going to make this city better. Probably the immediate thought was, we wish he'd go home. And then after that, we'd wish he'd go someplace else. Americans want to believe that it's a very natural thing for people to live together. And it's an aberration when they don't. And actually, if you look at human history, the exact opposite is true. That it's very difficult to bring different cultures together and have people live together in peace and learn to get along. And New York is the great experiment there, of one people piling on top of each other constantly. And that brings tremendous conflict. I think it's the greatest source of strength of New York, but it's also a source of conflict, um, disunion, um, struggle. Fewer than 170,000 people lived on the island of Manhattan in 1825. By any modern standard, the largest city in America was still a relatively peaceful place, compact, orderly, and even rural. Just two miles from where the Dutch had landed two centuries before, the closely knit town tapered off into a wilderness of farms, country lanes, and open fields. George Templeton Strong, a native New Yorker born as work on the Erie Canal began, could easily walk from his father's house down near the Battery up to the old pear tree Peter Stuyvesant had planted on the outskirts of town. Across the river in the village of Brooklyn, population 11,000, Long Island-born Walt Whitman loved to play baseball in the vacant fields that surrounded the sleepy town. Life in both cities was still strikingly simple. There was no regular police force, no professional fire department, no public transportation, only the most primitive water and sewage systems, and just a handful of public schools. At night, flickering gas lamps, introduced only two years before, scarcely lit the poorly paved streets, which after sundown were nearly deserted. It was confined to extremely lower Manhattan. My great-great-great-grandfather, um, who wrote a memoir of his childhood in the first decade of the 19th century, um, remembered that all above Grand Street was country. I mean, City Hall was his father, actually. My four-greats grandfather was a, was a city alderman. He was the one who found a compromise to get City Hall finished. It had been under construction for 10 years, and it was lying there unfinished because it was so expensive. He said, let's finish the back of City Hall with brownstone instead of with marble, because it's so far uptown, nobody will ever see the back of it anyway. Never again would life in New York City be so simple or harmonious. In the decades to come, forces that had been gathering for 200 years would converge on the island of Manhattan, transforming every aspect of life in the city and bringing every possibility and every problem of the modern age. All American cities uh, were experiencing uh, revolutionary change in terms of the way people lived. But in New York, it was on a more intense level because the size of the city, the narrowness of the geography, the intensity and extremeness of the growth was so much greater than other places. New York had only 100,000 people in 1800. By 1900, it had 50 times as many people. That's an incredible transformation. No city in America had ever grown so rapidly or so large. No city on Earth had ever brought so many different kinds of people together in one place at one time. Between 1825 and 1865, New Yorkers would confront the most daunting question of their entire history. 
could they create a new kind of order on the island of Manhattan? Or would the city explode into chaos and violence and subside into complete anarchy? We are rapidly becoming the London of America. I myself am astonished. And this city is the wonder of every stranger. John Pintard. Its advantages of position are perhaps unequaled anywhere. Situated on an island, which I think it will one day cover, it rises like Venice from the sea. And like that fairest of cities in the days of her glory, receives into its lap tribute of all the riches of the earth, Francis Trollope. From the day it opened in October 1825, the Erie Canal sparked an economic revolution that would transform forever life in New York City. Connecting the Great Lakes to the Hudson River and beyond, it transformed New York almost overnight into a gigantic funnel through which much of the wealth of the Western world would now have to pass. By the Erie Canal, New York effectively captured the economy of the Middle West, and it began to grow so extraordinarily quickly. It developed around 10 miles of street front per year in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. And it was just one gigantic construction zone. And once it starts, it begins to snowball. I mean, it's like a planetesimals building up into a planet. Once it gets enough gravity, it sucks in everything else. And that's what happened in New York, because New York was the largest city in the census. And then the larger it got, the larger it tended to go on. The canal changes everything. After that, New York would be out in front and would never look back. So in culture, uh, in the economy, in, in spurring industrialization, because now you've got a market for cast iron mass manufactured goods because they can go out, the ramifications are absolutely total uh, in, in, in all areas. By 1830, people were pouring into Manhattan to work in the new factories, offices, and workshops of the city. As commercial activity in Lower Manhattan exploded, the narrow lanes of the old Dutch village were transformed into the first district in the world devoted exclusively to commerce. So in New York City, almost for the first time in human history, you get an area that's just business, and people don't live there. You have to come there from somewhere else. So it's a breaking up, it's a transformation of the historic city. People with money begin to move away. The journey to work begins to increase. We have a different kind of a place, and New York City is at the forefront of that. We don't think about New York as an industrial city, really. We think Detroit, we think you know, Chicago, whatever. Uh, but in fact, by the time of the Civil War, New York was the biggest industrial city in the United States. What we have, in fact, is a kind of a metropolitan industrialization. It's small scale, there are little shops, most factories, so-called, are maybe 20 people large, and there's hundreds of them, there's thousands of them, and they're in incredible, intense competition with one another. With astonishing speed, the outlines of a modern mass metropolis were beginning to appear on the island of Manhattan, including the first slums and suburbs, the first modern police force, the first public transit system, the first department stores, and a vast new waterworks, the massive Croton Aqueduct, on the outskirts of town. By 1840, New York was moving into uncharted territory, no longer merely a port, but a giant vortex, drawing everything in America into its orbit. Goods, money, people, ideas, and increasingly, tensions. For better and for worse, one man wrote, New York is fast becoming, if she be not already, America. Before some point, I think my own sense of it is it's somewhere in the 1820s and 30s, one could feel that they could grasp the whole of New York. 
Uh, after that point, it became too complicated for people to have that kind of confidence. That's the difference between pre-modern New York and modern New York. It is a place of multiple realities and partial comprehensions, hopefully enough comprehension so that one doesn't go around lost and disoriented all the time. But I think it would be a far less interesting experience if one thought one really comprehended it. There is no great novel about New York. There is no single novel. There are a lot of very good New York novels. Um, but there's no single all-encompassing novel the way um, you could look at any number of Dickens books and say we know London as a result of that. I thought that probably the best novel of New York was the newspaper. If you sat down and read the newspapers, you'd get some gauge of what we'd gone through. And the reason is because it's dynamic. The reason is because it's of its dailiness. There's a dailiness to life in the city, a sense of surprise. It's the kind of a city that, although it insists on routine from a lot of its people, um, knows that routine is, is, a, is a utopian goal <laughs> and that some other thing is going to happen between here and 57th Street. You better be ready for it. The flight was a bold and perilous one. But here I am, in the great city of New York, safe and sound, without loss of blood or bone. In less than a week after leaving Baltimore, I was walking amid the hurrying throng and gazing upon the dazzling wonders of Broadway. The dreams of my childhood and the purpose of my manhood were now fulfilled a free state around me, and a free earth under my feet. What a moment this was to me, Frederick Douglass. April, 1842. Who does not know that our city is the great place of the Western continent? The heart, the brain, the focus, the main spring the no more beyond of the new world. Walt Whitman. In the spring of 1841, 22-year-old Walt Whitman arrived in Manhattan looking for work as a newspaper man. The son of a failed carpenter from Brooklyn, whose own mother thought him a good boy, but very strange. He was one of the tens of thousands of newcomers streaming in each year to find work in the city. The energy of the metropolis broke over him like a thunderstorm. This is the city, he wrote ecstatically, and I am one of its citizens. Silence. What can New York, noisy, roaring, rumbling, tumbling, bustling, turbulent New York, have to do with silence? Amid the universal clatter, the all-swallowing vortex, of the great money whirlpool. Who has any even distant idea of the profound repose of silence? Walt Whitman. He took to the city instantly and soon found work at a paper called the Aurora, one of the dozens of new penny papers springing up all over the island. There had never been anything like them sold on the streets for a penny apiece by gangs of ragged boys. They were filled not with sober shipping reports, but with eye-catching stories of crime, vice, and sex, often drawn from the streets of the city itself. Of them all, none was more popular than the New York Herald, founded in 1835 by a bombastic Scottish immigrant named James Gordon Bennett fond of comparing himself in the pages of his own journal to Julius Caesar, Shakespeare, and Alexander the Great. Up until the 1830s, newspapers had very small circulation, they were quite expensive, and they were always effectively owned by one political party. It was James Gordon Bennett who changed all of that. 
He put all the ideas together and came up with the New York Herald, which became the most successful newspaper in the world. It was very low priced, it was politically independent, and it was written not with the idea of instructing the reader with what he ought to know, but with giving the reader what he wanted to know. Modern journalism had begun. In its first two weeks alone, the Herald ran blood-curdling accounts of three suicides, three murders, a fire that killed five people, and an accident in which a man had blown his own head off. Monday, February 1st, 1841. There is a paper published in this city. I am not in the habit of quoting from it, for I consider it a disgrace. Nor would I do it now, but to protest against the depraved and vitiated taste of newspaper readers. It is an undeniable fact that this filthy sheet has a wider circulation than any other, not only here, but in other cities. Philip Hone. Reporters like Whitman went everywhere, covering the spectacular fires that broke out with increasing frequency now, and the epidemics of cholera that ravaged the increasingly congested slums. From the imposing ramparts of the new Croton Waterworks, way out on 42nd Street, to the dizzying spire of newly rebuilt Trinity Church, the tallest structure in town. The vast and interminable city was spread out as upon a map before us. There, beneath our feet, and stretching far away in every direction, lay one of the most beautiful and exciting spectacles ever looked upon, the New York Morning News. By the 1830s and 1840s, the city is so complicated. The city has got so much ethnic diversity, economic uh, differences, social differences, that people increasingly need a newspaper to help them to decode the city, to figure out what's going on. Here's a place where every day I can get a handle on what's actually going on, uh, and I can get some sense uh, of order um, to what's becoming a very disorderly place. In less than a decade, more than 20 dailies and dozens of weeklies had crowded into a five-block stretch across from City Hall called Printing House Row, along with Samuel Morse's new telegraph office and Matthew Brady's new photographic studio. By 1841, the bustling district around City Hall had become the center of news and information for the entire nation. Remember, at that period, we're talking still about a kind of walking city. That is to say, in a very, very small area, maybe a couple of miles, you could see the amazing contrasts that are growing up, even within a few blocks. If you think about where City Hall is, the center of government, you think about where Wall Street is, the center of commerce, and then you think about the five points, the sort of worst slum uh, of the era, they're all pretty much within the stone's throw of each other. And then if you include the emerging commercial entertainments like Barnum's Museum and so on, you can see that, that really within a very, very small area, you have all these amazing contrasts uh, of wealth and poverty, of high culture and low culture, of different ethnic uh, and racial groups. And all that stuff really in a fairly contained area. In the winter of 1841, an extraordinary establishment called the American Museum opened its doors for the first time on the corner of Broadway and Printing House Row, at the very heart of the new metropolis. Its proprietor was a 31-year-old itinerant showman from Connecticut named Phineas T. Barnum, an ex-newspaper man with an uncanny instinct for the new mass culture beginning to emerge in New York City. Barnum is a quintessential New Yorker, in part because he's not from New York. He has a sense of the times. He has a sense of the chaos of the times, of the urban kind of milieu. There's lots of people coming in and out of New York. There's movement. There's differences. Uh, people are not quite sure how to relate to each other. They're not quite sure who to trust anymore. They're not quite sure if the person who appears to be a gentleman because he's wearing good clothing and has a beautiful pocket watch is someone who really truly is a gentleman or not. Eager to exploit the shifting interests and anxieties 
of New York's increasingly diverse citizenry. Barnum programmed something for everyone in the American Museum, including a scale model of Dublin for the growing number of Irish immigrants, and a 3,000-seat Morrow Lecture Room for New York's upright middle-class establishment. Other popular attractions included a mermaid from Fiji, a knitting machine operated by a dog, a bearded girl named Annie Jones, a 25-inch midget named General Tom Thumb, a pair of Chinese brothers named Chang and Eng, the original Siamese twins, and playing to the growing national obsession with the question of race and origins, an 18-year-old microcephalic black man from Georgia, whom Barnum presented simply as the what is it. March 2nd, Friday. Stopped at Barnum's on my way downtown to see the much advertised what is it. Some say it's an advanced chimpanzee, but it seems to me clearly an idiotic Negro dwarf raised perhaps in Alabama or Virginia. His anatomical details are fearfully simian. A great fact for Darwin. George Templeton Strong. Barnum was the primal huckster. He was the Adam and Eve of hucksterism. But the idea was to draw a paying crowd, no matter what. And he was a genius at it. He changed his tricks on over and over again. He had a seemingly unending number of them. Now and then, someone would cry out humbug and charlatan, but so much the better for me. It helped to advertise me, and I was willing to bear the reputation. I engaged queer curiosities and even monstrosities simply to add notoriety to the museum. P.T. Barnum. There's a game that's being played here. They enjoy the notion that they're being conned, and, and he's almost inviting you to figure out how he's done it. You know, what's, where's the humbug uh, in this? And you know that you're being head, but there's a pleasure in the game of both being head, knowing that you're being head, trying to decipher how he's doing, you know, how does the magician work, work his tricks? So Barnum is the spiritual grandfather of Valley Who, of advertising and public relations of a bold brassiness that's a critical component of the New York psyche, certainly from that point on. From the day it opened, the American Museum was a stunning success. During its 27-year run, Barnum would sell 42 million tickets, 7 million more than the entire population of the United States. Inside, the enormous differences already dividing New Yorkers dwindled for a moment against the backdrop of the human extremes on display. Outside on the city streets, however, those differences were becoming more and more troubling with each passing year. I think the fiction of New York history and New Yorker self-perception is that they were the most tolerant people in the world, the cosmopolitan New Yorker, able to accept anyone who came. The reality of New York history reveals quite a bit more tension and conflict in the actual day-to-day -day social relations of New Yorkers. This was never said that welcomed immigrants. If you, if you read the history of New York, um, whichever group was coming at the time, everyone hated. And then the group that got here five minutes before them had someone to look down on, and that's always been the case. June 2nd, 1836. They arrived at this port during the month of May 15,825 passengers. All Europe is coming across the ocean. All that part, at least, who cannot make a living at home. And what shall we do with them? They increase our taxes, eat our bread, and encumber our streets. And not one in 20 is competent to keep himself. Philip Holm. For years, the number of immigrants coming into the city had been on the rise as the demand for workers grew. By 1840, more than 50,000 Germans had pushed in, settling in an insulated neighborhood of their own called Klein Deutschland, or Little Germany. An even greater number had emigrated from Ireland, impoverished farmers and unskilled day laborers mainly. 
most of whom quickly found work, taking on the worst and toughest jobs in the city. Digging sewers, paving streets, building houses, or working as servants, scullery maids, and seamstresses. By 1842, nearly 100,000 Irish immigrants had flooded into New York City, fueling waves of virulent anti-Catholic bigotry and the bitter resentment of native-born workers who feared for their jobs. It's very hard for people nowadays to realize there was a white, Christian, English-speaking immigrant group that was essentially seen as another race, so far in that they could never be absorbed into the United States. Their arrival, really, in the 1840s triggers the growth of the American Party, as it's called at the time, or the Know Nothing Party, which is essentially um, said, we have to stop the immigration of these people to the country. They're going to, they're going to destroy our identity. They can never be loyal because of their loyalty to the Catholic Church. They don't want to work, they're shiftless, they're violent. This was the perception. One of the most interesting thing about the Irish is the kind of discrimination that they, fa that they faced when they came to New York. All of the cartoons of the period show them with huge brows, show them drunk all the time, show them involved in fights and brawls. The Irish were called the blacks of the 19th century. They were not considered to be white. Ethnic conflict had already reached alarming levels on the streets of the city, when in the summer of 1845, a tragedy of unimaginable proportions in the Irish countryside sent a tidal wave of desperate people streaming towards New York. In the years to come, the influx of famine Irish immigrants would overwhelm the city's resources completely and change forever the social and political balance of the metropolis. The Great Migration begins in 1845. Between 1845 and 1855, you have a million people die in Ireland in the potato famine, the great defining event of modern Irish history. 2.1 million leave. The 1.5 that come to the United States, a million come across South Street in a 10-year period. And it's an immigration very unlike the immigrations that follow. One, because it's in sailing ships. It's not in the steamships that become the regular vessel across the Atlantic in seven days. This is a 30-day passage. Some of them were called coffin ships because there were more people dead on them than alive when they landed. And you have a million people, one-eighth of the Irish nation comes across South Street in a 10-year period. There's no other immigration from Europe like that in the 19th century. Hundreds of our people just cast on shore from the immigrant ships parade daily the streets of New York as howling beggars. They sleep in droves in the station houses, the commissioners supplying them with bread. In the morning, they wander over the city, begging. No city on earth had ever had to contend with such an onslaught of humanity. In 1854, an old concert hall at the foot of Manhattan, called Castle Garden, was pressed into service to handle the flood tide of impoverished newcomers. By then, there were more Irish in New York City than any other place in the world except Dublin. And still they came on, pushing the congestion in the new slums to more than 300 people per acre, five times the density city fathers had anticipated when laying out the street plan 50 years before. The huge famine Irish emigration that hit in the 40s uh, brought here a, a, a rural people uh, who uh, had no urban skills, many of them had no English, uh, and, and settled into pretty miserable conditions pretty fast. As thousands of Irish immigrants pushed into the Five Points, one of the only areas in the city where African Americans could afford to live, the two groups were thrown into increasingly bitter competition for the worst dwellings and the lowest paying jobs. Every hour, sees us elbowed out of some employment, to make room, perhaps, for some newly arrived immigrants, whose hunger and color are thought to give them title to a special favor. Frederick Douglass. We'd like to think that segregation is a southern phenomenon. It's not, it's a northern phenomenon. And there are black burial grounds, uh, and there are white burial grounds. There are black sections in churches, the nigger pews up in the top, so 
Racism is built into the very structure and culture of the city, and it's only exacerbated by the new arrivals. Profit-hungry New York businessmen only made matters worse, hiring Irish laborers instead of blacks because they would work for even less money, then using blacks as strike breakers whenever the Irish threatened a walkout for better wages. By 1855, the two groups with the most in common in New York were locked in a life and death struggle on the lowest rung of the city's economic ladder. Of the two groups that have come to New York, there are striking similarities between the Irish and African Americans. The Irish come from a rural culture in which they are essentially dispossessed. They're not connected to the government where they come from. There are no institutions that reflect who they are. Their culture is in, their, in, in two things, really. It's in, the, it's in their song and it's in their church. And those are the two things they take with them when they come out of this culture where they've even lost their language. They take on the language of the people uh, who've conquered them and they give new life to that language. Few groups coming to New York would ever suffer the hardship and misery experienced by the famine Irish, crowded into filthy, vermin-infested housing and brutally derided by their fellow citizens. Devastating outbreaks of cholera and other diseases routinely swept through the wards they inhabited, where the death rate was often three times higher than the rest of the city. Infants and children die in fearful ratios, one worried observer noted. And yet, even as the concern of middle-class reformers mounted, most New Yorkers blamed the newcomers themselves for their condition. You have no idea what an immense vat of misery and crime and filth this great city is. I realize it more and more. Think of 10,000 children growing up almost sure to be prostitutes and rogues. Charles Loring Brace. Fearing for the future of the city, Protestant missionaries invaded the slums hoping to assimilate the Irish before it was too late. In 1853, an Episcopal clergyman named Charles Loring Brace started the Children's Aid Society. For 17 cents a night, abandoned children could get a warm bed and bath, a hot supper of pork and beans, and, to the fury of Irish Catholic New Yorkers, Protestant religious instruction, often administered by Brace himself. Charles Loring Brace founded the Children's Aid Society. He wrote a book called The Dangerous Classes of New York, and he pointed to the condition of the children living in those cellar holes without parental supervision, so often orphans, often abandoned, called The Dangerous Classes of New York. He said, you see them now, but wait. In 20 years' time, they will have grown up, and they will vote. And what will they vote themselves? And we have to respond to them. You've got a city that is overrun with thousands of vagrant children, neighborhoods in which church life uh, doesn't seem to really be that important. So from the perspective of people like uh, 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 Hone or Brace or other middle-class and upper-class reformers, um, I think the 1850s really seems like a crisis moment precisely because traditional sources of authority no longer seem to be uh, able to, uh, to keep the city uh, under control. The streets at night are infested with ruffians of all descriptions. They hang around corners. They move about in gangs, men and boys together, abusing and sometimes hitting the quiet passerby. There is no security for life or limb in the present disorderly state of things. The New York Times. Violence of every kind now routinely erupted on the city streets. There were working class riots against the upper class, nativist riots against the foreign born, anti-Irish riots, anti-English riots, and anti-black. In the Fifth Ward, and what was now called the Bloody Sixth, Rival gangs of Protestants and Catholics vied for control of the streets, striking terror in the hearts of middle-class New Yorkers, like the conservative lawyer George Templeton Strong, who now retreated even farther uptown. November 13, 1854, 
met a prodigious know-nothing procession moving uptown as I omnibus down Broadway to the vestry meeting. A most emphatic and truculent demonstration. They looked as if they might have designs on St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I think the Celts of Prince and Mott Streets would have found them ugly customers. We may well have the tremendous riot and carnage here at any moment. George Templeton Strong. By 1854, the chaos on the city streets had reached all the way to City Hall. That fall, to the horror of many upper-class New Yorkers, a slippery and corruptible one-time liquor store owner named Fernando Wood swept into the mayor's office on a tide of Irish and German votes, backed by a new force in city politics called Tammany Hall. The important point about Wood is that he was really the first New York politician to sort of nakedly mobilize the votes of these immigrants, uh, of the working classes, with the promise of, of sort of paying them off uh, with jobs, with patronage, with favors, and so on and so forth. For the middle class and upper class uh, genteel elite of New York, that seemed to be a very frightening thing indeed because it really suggested that politics was now going to be worked out in a very, very different kind of way. By 1857, New York was on the verge of what George Templeton Strong called municipal civil war. That spring, Wood's Republican opponents, determined to drive the Democrat from office, had the state legislature rewrite the city charter, stripping the mayor of most of his powers. On June 17th, two rival police departments, Wood's Municipals and the state-run Metropolitans, rioted on the steps of City Hall in the heart of what the New York Times called the worst governed city in the world. Surveying the chaos, the editor of Harper's Monthly threw up his hands in despair. Nothing has gone as it was meant to go, he wrote, nor is anything where, according to map and calculation, it should be. For many people around the country, what's going on in New York may seem frightening, scary. To many people in New York, it seems frightening, scary. But I think there's also a sense that, that increasingly this is also going to be the future. This is what we're becoming. This is where America is heading. And so we need to figure out what's going on in New York if we're going to figure out the future of the republic. July 7th, 1857. Yesterday morning, I was spectator of a strange, weird, painful scene. The earth had caved in a few minutes before and crushed the breath out of a pair of ill-starred Celtic laborers. Around them were a few men, listless and inert enough, but not so the women. I suppose they were keening. A wild, unearthly cry, half shriek and half song. Now and then, one of them would throw herself down on one of the corpses wipe some trace of defilement from the face of the dead man with her apron, slowly and carefully, and then resume her lament. It was an uncanny sound to hear, quite new to me. Our Celtic fellow citizens are almost as remote from us in temperament and constitution as the Chinese. George Templeton Strong. Manahatta. How fit a name for America's great democratic island city. The word itself, how beautiful, how aboriginal, how it seems to rise with tall spires glistening in sunshine, with such new world atmosphere, vista, and action. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless. These heated, torn, distracted ages are to be compacted and made whole. Walt Whitman. On July 5th, 1855, a slim volume of poetry, bound in green cloth and embossed in gold, went on sale in Manhattan's bookstores. 
though his name appeared nowhere on the front cover. The author was 36-year-old Walt Whitman, now living with his mother on Ryerson Street in Brooklyn, doing odd jobs as a printer, writer, and builder. The book, he said, arose out of my life in Brooklyn and New York, absorbing a million people for 15 years with an intimacy and eagerness and abandon probably never equaled. Nothing like it had ever been written before in the English language. If you read 1855 Leaves of Grass, well, there's not one archaic word in it. It rings like so much of it like it could have been written yesterday, that um, this man saw things. He just had this penetrating look into the New York soul, which very few people have ever had. But he had it, and he put it down on paper, and it will always be there. The 12 poems it contained, and the dozens more Whitman added in the years to come, were composed during the most turbulent years in the life of New York, as the forces of growth and expansion threatened to pull the city apart. Yet, embracing the entire human landscape of New York, Whitman hoped to show his fellow citizens what brought them together, rather than what drove them apart. The job of the poet, he wrote, was to resolve all tongues into his own. The poet is the joiner. He sees how they join. Nested in nests of water bays, superb, rich, hemmed thick all round with sail ships and steamships. An island, 16 miles long, solid founded. Numberless crowded streets, high growths of iron, slender, strong, light, splendidly uprising toward clear skies. The countless masts, the white shore steamers, the lighters, the ferry boats. The downtown streets, the houses of business of the ship merchants and money brokers, the river streets. The poems are like streets, you know. He has this long line, you know, which is like walking a street. And then he comes to the end of it and he walks another street. And each line is another picture, another person, another encounter. Just the additive, inventorying, cataloging uh, nature of Whitman is, is obviously the first response that one can have to a city like New York. What am I supposed to make of all this? Well, let me list it. Let me start simply by listing it. He also describes the people of the city and the closeness of his sort of collective feelings uh, with them. I think that uh, there is no one else, no other poet, I think, uh, a writer, who has so literally absorbed the city. What he did is he seemed to absorb it and then refract it back on itself. Immigrants arriving. 15 or 20,000 a week. The carts hauling goods. The manly race of drivers of horses. The brown-faced sailors. Broadway, the women, the shops and shows. A million people. Manners free and superb. Open voices. Hospitality, the most courageous and friendly young men. City of hurried and sparkling waters. City of spires and masts. City nested in bays. My city, Walt Whitman. In Whitman, he's tremendously excited by the traffic, by the noise, by the immigrants getting off the boat, by the crowds, by the stuff that everybody finds ungenteel. And he's saying that, in fact, that, 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 that this is New York's real contribution to the world, that this kind of noise, you know, is the sound of the future. And that instead of, that it doesn't drown us out, you know, that in fact, it enables us to talk 
to talk more, to talk new ways, to talk new languages. If you read most of the commentaries on immigration in the 19th century, um, they only see the dark side of this immigration. He saw the strength that these people had. He heard their music. He went in the streets with them. And he had the sense of the power of the city, I think, comes out of these people. That it's, it's not just that one group represents a city, it's this mix and the energy that comes out of it, and that this defines the soul of New York. And it's something to celebrate. Yes, it brings problems. Yes, it brings turmoil. But I think the whole power of Whitman's poetry is in this celebration of out of this differences, out of this struggle, something great is going to come. And I think he's the only one in the 19th century at that particular time in New York history who understands it and sees it and celebrates it. Where some saw an alien crowd of strangers, Whitman saw a great democratic vista, an endless river of people each pursuing his or her own destiny. Where some saw the clash of races, classes, religions, and nationalities, he saw a daily sharing and reveled in the dissonant chorus of New Yorkers, calling it the glorious jam. Where some saw tumult and unrest, he felt the thrilling excitement of city life and the rising of a new kind of culture based on curiosity, fantasy, and desire. Whitman wanted uh, honesty, candor, like inadvertent frankness, directness, and he wanted adhesiveness or affection. And there's an element of uh, wildness in it, wild love. He wanted to be a, you know, a city of orgies is one of the names of his poems. He liked that element of the uh, unexpected, the uh, orgiastic, the uh, inadvertent meeting of eyes. He understood how sexuality was one of the keys to the excitement of a city and one of the forces that held it together. How the experience of fantasy itself was one of the central experiences of city life, that people could look at each other and imagine sleeping with each other. He went around and um, looked at all the strangers um, and, and saw each one as a potential lover. You know, you felt that he was so filled with a kind of uh, undischarged erotic energy that uh, even lampposts could have been lovers for him, you know, or certainly ship masts, you know. Um, and yet, it, it, you know, there's a sense um, in Whitman's poems of um, not of consummation so much as longing, a longing that keeps going out from him. The proof of the poet, Whitman declared, is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed them. To bolster sales, he mailed in anonymous reviews of his own work, including one calling it the most glorious of triumphs in the known history of literature. But though he hoped his poems would take the country by storm, most readers were shocked by his unconventional style and by the frank sexuality of the poems. The book did not sell well. Yet even in the difficult times to come, Whitman would continue to hope that his countrymen would make the immense democratic promise he had once glimpsed on the streets of New York, a concrete reality. It's, it's overpowering sometimes, Whitman's poetry. Just going over the Brooklyn Bridge and reading Brooklyn Ferry and, and hearing his voice talking to you. I mean, I don't want to get sentimental, but it, New Yorkers aren't sentimental, but it could make you cry. Flood tide below me, I see you face to face. On the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross, returning home, are more curious to me than you suppose. In you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me, and more in my meditations than you might suppose. It avails not. Time nor place, distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations hence. Just as you feel when you look on the river and the sky, so I felt. Just as any of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, 
I was refreshed. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, I stood, yet was hurried. Just as you look on the numberless masts of ships and the thick stem pipes of steamboats, I looked. These and all else were to me the same as they are to you, Walt Whitman. In the summer of 1857, Whitman's hopes for his democratic island city were dealt a grievous blow. In the last weeks of August, 20 years of frenzied speculation on Wall Street came to a shocking end when panic swept through the financial district, precipitating the severest economic crisis in the nation's history. September 28, 1857, Panic is very dreadful in Wall Street. Failures are multiplying, and no one knows on whom he can depend, or on what. October 10th, we seem foundering. Affairs are worse than ever today, and a period of general insolvency seems close upon us. People's faces in Wall Street look fearfully gaunt and desperate. November 10th, this financial crisis has thrown thousands of the working class out of employment and made it a difficult matter enough to maintain peace and order in the city through the winter. George Templeton Strong. For the country's growing urban population, the panic was nothing less than a disaster. Walt Whitman estimated that in New York alone, more than 25,000 people were soon out of work and 100,000 more facing hardship and even starvation. Hardest hit were those with the fewest resources, the immigrant poor and the city's beleaguered black population. We're talking about a period where there's no social security, there's no unemployment relief, there's no Medicare or Medicaid. There is not that um, social safety net yet that's, that's erected in the 20th century uh, that helps to ease some of that. And so uh, when you're unemployed or when you're widowed or your child is in trouble with the law, you're hurt, you're injured. Life is very, very tough for those people. In the fall of 1857, as banks failed and businesses closed, and thousands of unemployed New Yorkers wandered the city streets homeless, the state authorities now in control of New York embarked upon one of the greatest public works projects ever undertaken in an American city. It would be the most ambitious attempt yet to make Whitman's democratic island city a concrete reality. Circumambulate the city of a dreamy Sabbath afternoon. What do you see? Posted like silent sentinels all around the town, stand thousands upon thousands of mortal men, some leaning against the spiles, some seated in the pier heads, some looking over the bulwarks of ships. These are all landsmen of weekdays tied to counters, nailed to benches, clinched to desks. How then to this? Are the green fields gone? Him in Melville. There is no place within the city in which it is pleasant to walk or ride, no field for baseball or cricket, no pleasant garden where one can sit with and chat with a friend or listen to the music of a good band. Clarence Cook. Of all the deficiencies of the 1811 grid plan, none was more glaring by 1857 than the failure to provide enough park space for New York's overworked and overcrowded citizens. Half a century of explosive growth had transformed much of Lower Manhattan into a congested wasteland of factories, warehouses, and tenements. For most New Yorkers, there was simply no escape. 
What few backyard spaces remained had been all but obliterated, and access to the riverfront almost completely cut off by a tangled belt of shipyards and docks. Commerce is devouring inch by inch the coast of the island. If we would rescue any part of it for health and recreation, it must be done now. William Cullen Bryant. Remember, in this day, um, people are packed pretty tight together. Uh, you've got roughly half a million people living south of 14th Street. Think about that. And, and there are no buildings, really, that are taller than five or six stories high. Uh, people are packed in very tight. In 1857, as the city spiraled ever more deeply into economic gloom, New York undertook the greatest physical transformation of Manhattan since the grid. That fall, the city finished purchasing a vast tract of sparsely populated land north of town, then issued eviction notices to the 1,600 mainly black and Irish residents living on it. Two weeks later, Mayor Fernando Wood announced a special design contest for what was called simply the Central Park. Six months later, the winner was announced. Entry number 33, called Greensward, by Calvert Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted. They were an unlikely choice for the job. Vox, a respected English architect, had never designed a public park before. Olmsted, a frail and melancholy 35-year-old writer, had never designed anything at all. But both men were acutely aware what the driving commercial city was doing to its people, breeding physical congestion, social disorder, and spiritual unrest. New Yorkers display a remarkable quickness of apprehension, along with a peculiarly hard sort of selfishness. Every day of their lives, they have seen thousands of their fellow men, have met them face to face, have brushed against them, and yet have had no experience of anything in common with them. There need to be places and times for reunions, where the rich and poor, the cultivated and the self-made, shall be attracted together and encouraged to assimilate. Frederick Law Olmsted. The park Olmsted and Vox now proposed would be an entirely new kind of public space, a man-made nature that would provide relief from the unrelenting commercial intensity of the city. As New Yorkers entered the park, they would leave behind the constant reminders of their differences and, it was hoped, rediscover a common humanity. If this was to be a symbol of American metropolitan democracy, and he proposed that all peoples would find a space in this park. It wasn't just a spot of greenery that looked nice in the middle of the city and let the place breathe. Olmsted's vision was in part that the classes will mingle here, that the upper classes and the lower classes will see each other, and that it will have a tremendous civilizing effect on the city. That mingling of people will have a civilizing effect. Olmsted and Vox set right to work, translating democratic ideas, as Vox himself put it, into trees and dirt. By the spring of 1858, an army of city employees was hard at work, laboriously remodeling every feature of the natural landscape. There were German gardeners, Italian stonecutters, and hundreds of masons, blacksmiths, and carpenters. Most of the men were unskilled Irish day laborers, often paid less than a dollar a day, and drawn, Olmsted said, from the poorest, most dangerous class of the great city's population. To prevent any trouble with the Irish, African Americans had been excluded from the workforce entirely. My office was regularly surrounded by an organized mob, carrying a banner inscribed blood or bread. This mob sent into me a list of 10,000 names of men, alleged to have starving families, demanding that they should be immediately put to work. Frederick Law Olmsted. It was one of the great pieces of construction of its time, and maybe even to this day. And it was man making nature 
for the benefit of the people of the city, which is already another aspect of the phenomenal self-confidence of New Yorkers. We didn't need to go out into the country. We would bring the country back here. We would create an idealized version of the way Manhattan was, but in fact, it's much nicer. It was lousy land, and they created a paradise on it. June 11th, 1859. Improve the day by leaving Wall Street early and set off to explore the Central Park, which will be a feature of the city within five years and a lovely place in AD 1900, when its trees will have acquired dignity and appreciable diameters. Perhaps the city itself will perish before then by growing too big to live under 40 institutions corruptly administered. George Templeton Strong. In the spring of 1859, an inventor named Thaddeus Lowe sailed high above the construction site in his new hydrogen-filled balloon called the City of New York, from which he could see the first completed sections of the park. He was stunned by what he saw. Sprawling across 843 acres, 80 times the size of the next largest park in the city, stretched an endless labyrinth of artfully composed vistas and scenes. It was, one man later said, 19th century America's greatest work of art. These guys plan this the way a later generation would plan a movie. They think about it kinetically. You move through this space and you have a series of composed views. They're constructing environments that are in the height of unnaturalness because they are man-made environments, but the point is that they feel like they're real, unlike the artifice of the city. You can't underestimate Central Park as a, a vision because it was not built in the middle of what the city was, it was built in the middle of what the city would become. Central Park, instead of having these piddling squares, as though New York was a collection of Kensington-like neighborhoods in London, we would have one huge 840-acre, no small piece of land, big pleasure ground for the city. The park would not be a landscaped, uh, formal thing in the French tradition, but would be a kind of piece of captured nature. Entering at Fifth Avenue and 59th Street, visitors were led slowly out of the city along an elegant tree-lined mall, a street of nature, skewed away from the city's rigid street plan and penetrating ever deeper into the interior of the park. At the far northern end of the mall, the scene suddenly widened to reveal a breathtaking view. Stretching as far as the eye could see, the park gave the illusion that the open space went on, perhaps forever. An image of the unspoiled continent America itself had once been, now transformed into an urban paradise and permanently preserved. On a bright moonlit night in the summer, the scene to be witnessed on the lake is brilliant. The clear waters gleam like polished steel and are dotted in every direction with pleasure boats. No sight or sound of the great city is at hand to disturb you. And you may lie back in your boat with half-shut eyes and think yourself in fairyland. James D. McCabe, Jr. October 1st, 1859. Who is not proud that in a day of swindling in politics and of cast iron in building, such grand works can be achieved in rugged honesty and solid stone. It silences forever the clatter of skeptics of the democratic principle as inimical to vast public works. Harper's Weekly. Aesthetically, Central Park was a triumph from the start. But to Vox and Olmsted's disappointment, it proved more popular with wealthier New Yorkers than with the city's working poor, who needed it most, but found it hardest to reach. At this point, in the late 50s, 
The area that they've got picked out is way to the north of the regular city. Omnibus and horse cars do run up there, but it costs at least a nickel, and for workingmen's dollar a day wage, a nickel there and back, and for your whole family, it's, you know, they're, they're going to come, but it's, it's going to be basically a genteel province. On Sunday afternoons, the long sweeping drives streamed with elegant carriages, fewer than one in 20 New Yorkers could afford, while working class vehicles were barred entirely. The Irish and German day laborers who had built the park found themselves further discouraged from using it by the long list of rules Olmsted had drawn up for its use. There were signs posted everywhere prohibiting group picnics, walking on the grass, and strenuous activity of any kind. Schoolboys were strictly forbidden from playing baseball unless they had a note from their principal. He made a place that was for everyone, but then he wrote so many complicated rules about how it was to be used. Clearly, everyone had to, uh, to uh, conform to a code of behavior that he thought was appropriate for a democratic American society. You know, it's a little bit like the melting pot. Everybody goes in from everywhere, and they all came out Presbyterian. Vox and Olmsted have part police so that they, in fact, decide that the kind of behaviors that are going to be permitted here are not those of the rough and tumble Bowery world, but in essence, Broadway refinement. So that you can't have militia parades, and you can't have sports, and you can't have uh, vigorous uh, demos uh, un unleashed, and you can't have disorder and riots, God knows, in particular. By 1860, the main features of Central Park were nearing completion. But Olmsted and Vox's masterpiece had done little to ease the tensions dividing the troubled city. And by then, few New Yorkers and few Americans were thinking about parks anyway. The unrest that had been building in the city for half a century was about to be overtaken by the worst crisis in American history. In the conflict to come, New York would play a role more eventful and strange than anyone could have imagined. At 11.30 on the morning of Saturday, February 25th, 1860, a tall gangling man in an ill-fitting black coat and battered beaver skin hat stepped off the Cortland Street Ferry in Manhattan. A lawyer and ex-congressman, little known outside his home state of Illinois, he had come to New York hoping to bolster his slim chances of winning the Republican presidential nomination. When no one met him at the dock on arrival, Abraham Lincoln found his way alone to the Astor House Hotel across from City Hall on Broadway. Lincoln comes to town in 1860. What does he do? He goes to the Astor Hotel, you know, which is where the celebrities stay. They give the announcement of this to the local newspapers, which are right across the street, and they write this up. New York is already becoming an engine of celebrity creation. On Sunday, the candidate took the ferry to Brooklyn to hear the Reverend Henry Ward Beecher rail against slavery. Back in Manhattan, he attended a minstrel show on the Bowery roaring with delight at a new hit tune, written in Manhattan the year before, called Dixon. Everything was riding on the speech Lincoln was to give at the Cooper Institute on Monday. That afternoon, in a pouring rain, he stopped by Knox's hat store on Broadway and traded in his old beaver skin for a shiny silk top hat, then crossed over to Matthew Brady's Daguerrean studio to sit for a formal portrait. As evening came and the rain turned to snow, Lincoln's worry about the turnout began to mount. But the New York press corps had done its work. And by 7.30, more than 1,500 people had filled the great hall of Cooper Union to capacity to give the odd-looking Westerner with the high nasal voice a hearing. Stifled laughter rippled through the hall as the candidate began to speak. But the crowd grew quiet as he warmed to his theme, imploring his listeners with passionate logic to restrict the spread of slavery. Pretty soon I forgot his clothes, his appearance, and his peculiarities. 
Presently, forgetting myself, I was on my feet with the rest, yelling like a wild Indian, cheering this wonderful man. When I came out of the hall, a friend with his eyes aglow asked me what I thought about Abe Lincoln, the rail splitter. I said, he's the greatest man since St. Paul. And I think so yet. The next morning, Lincoln woke to find himself a national celebrity. No man, Horace Greeley wrote in the New York Tribune, ever before made such an impression on his first appeal to a New York audience. His speech had been reprinted in full in the daily papers and in pamphlets that were already making their way across the country, together with reproductions of Matthew Brady's photograph. Looking back, Lincoln never forgot what his three-day sojourn in New York City had done for him. Matthew Brady and the Cooper Institute, he said simply, made me president. On November 15th, 1860, one week after Lincoln's election, a giant meteor could be seen illuminating the skies above the city. Omens, auguries, and portents dire, the New York Times declared. Lincoln's startling rise confirmed the worst Southern fears. The North and its rapidly expanding cities were going to destroy the Southern way of life. Within days, South Carolina had called for a special session of the state legislature to consider seceding from the Union. In New York, merchants and bankers with Southern investments grew uneasy. New York was a Southern city. It was the southernmost city north of the Mason-Dixon line because, in fact, its fate relied upon the slave system. We carried Southern goods, we insured Southern goods, we financed uh, the purchase of slaves. We were totally imbricated in the Southern slave system. This meant that with the approach of war and the increasing North-South uh, cultural hostilities, uh, New York was the most reluctant of any place to come to some kind of break because they knew that they would have the most to lose. First of all, they didn't want to break up what was a very prosperous trading situation with the Confederate States. And secondly, they knew full well that the estimated $40 million owed to them by Southerners would likely not be paid in the event of hostilities. On January 21st, 1861, fearing that war would interrupt the lucrative cotton trade, Mayor Fernando Wood suggested that New York itself secede from the Union. And in fact, they passed a sort of non-binding um, agreement of secession or statement of secession in which New York declared itself the Empire City of the South and dedicated therefore more to its commercial ties than its political ties with the Union and Lincoln. Saturday, April 13th, 1861. This morning's papers confirmed last night's news that the rebels opened fire at Sumter yesterday morning. So civil war is inaugurated at last. God defend the right. George Templeton Strong. When news reached the divided city that the Confederates had fired on Fort Sumter, an immense tide of pro-Union sentiment swept through New York. There was now no turning back. On April 20th, 1861, 250,000 merchants, clerks, and working men jammed Union Square for a rally in support of the Northern cause. It was, Horace Greeley said, the greatest popular demonstration ever known in America. April 20th, 1861. Walked uptown at two. Broadway crowded and more crowded as one approached Union Square. Large companies of recruits parading up and down, cheered and cheering. Every other man, woman, and child bearing a flag or decorated with a cockade. The city seems to have gone suddenly wild and crazy. George Templeton Strong. So the city and country went to war. 
Before it was over, more than 150,000 New Yorkers, including 50,000 Irishmen, tens of thousands of Germans, and 8,000 blacks would fight for the Union cause. Frederick Law Olmsted resigned from his post at Central Park to help run the U.S. Sanitary Commission. He would soon be responsible for the health and well-being of hundreds of thousands of Union soldiers. Walt Whitman would soon go south, too, as a volunteer in the crowded Washington hospitals. George Templeton Strong, too old at 41 for active duty, helped train a brigade of local sharpshooters called the New York Rifles. The Civil War was the first industrialized war ever. And it produced an industrial north to make it possible. The machines, the mills, the factories roaring out. Um, and New York was the financial capital of that new capitalist world. Uh, it was in that white heat of the war uh, that in industrial America finally emerged. The war was incredibly beneficial for New York City. The manufacturers of uniforms, of saddles, of leather goods, of guns, you name it, in fact, were making money hand over fist. And yet, while industrialists and war profiteers grew rich, the conflict would bring hardship and misery to tens of thousands of ordinary New Yorkers. As rents climbed, inflation soared, and the casualties mounted. It would also bring to a tragic climax antagonisms that had been building for years. Between rich and poor, native-born and immigrant, Protestant and Catholic, white and black. All those tensions would come to a head in the long, hot summer of 1863. And when the trouble came, it would begin with the most wretched and despised of the city's beleaguered citizens. Resentment had been building for a very long time. There are class animosities that have driven the city. The Irish, for instance, have been proselytized and missionized and invaded by these Protestant missionaries who have been out to reform them, who have decided that they're subpar, in some cases barely subhuman, uh, certainly heathens are the, certainly the wrong religion. These people are finding themselves, many of them, uh, with their wages, in fact, going steadily down, the quality of their living uh, arrangements, in fact, going down. But there's a lot of people who are getting the short end of the stick, and they find it now exacerbated by the wartime conditions, but the draft triggers it. By 1863, opposition to the war had been growing for more than a year, especially amongst the Irish. As one Union defeat followed another, and the horrifying casualty lists grew longer, anger towards the government intensified. Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which had taken effect on the first of the year and which asked whites to fight and die for the freedom of blacks, only made matters worse. But it was the passage of the Conscription Act in the spring of 1863, the first federal draft in American history that aroused the most fury. It authorized the government to draft hundreds of thousands of men into the Union Army against their will. Anyone with $300 to spare, meanwhile, nearly a year's wages for most working men, could buy their way out. For the Irish, it was the last straw. The opinion among the Irish was that emancipation would result in hordes of blacks coming north and working for less than they did, and they were working for minimum wages as it was. But the reality was that the oldest ethnic group in New York next to the Dutch are African Americans. And it was the Irish immigrants who had really driven African Americans out of serving jobs and uh, hauling waste and every menial job there was. The Irish had taken those jobs. They were making it harder in the 1860s for African Americans to get jobs. But the Irish fear was that emancipation would result in blacks taking their jobs. And the rich don't have to fight in this war because they can pay $300 to get out of it. It was a perceived injustice, and in some ways, I think it was a real injustice. In June 1863, the war moved closer to home when Confederate forces under Robert E. Lee invaded the North, spreading terror throughout the Union and threatening Harrisburg, Philadelphia, New York itself. 
As the July date set for New York's draft lottery approached, fear and resentment amongst the city's immigrant poor began to seethe out of control. In, I think, 59, 60, in the campaign that Lincoln was elected in, a Southerner wrote a book, which was a science fiction scenario, what would happen if? And he spelled out a possibility that included great riots breaking out in northern cities along class lines of the Irish rising, armies being heavy to pull back to deal with them, and the South uh, becoming triumphant. And that scenario, you know, was arguably within an ace of being played out. On the 4th of July, word reached New York by telegraph that more than 50,000 men had fallen outside a tiny town in Pennsylvania, only 150 miles away, called Gettysburg. One week later, on Saturday, July 11th, 1863, drawings began at the Uptown Draft Office on 3rd Avenue near 46th Street. The first to be called was a man named Jones. By six that night, more than 1,200 names had been pulled from the drum. July 12th, 1863. Draft has begun here, and was in progress in Boston last week. We shall have trouble before we are through. The critical time will be when defaulting conscripts are hauled out of their houses, as many will be, this draft will be the crucial experiment to decide whether we have a government among us. George Templeton Strong. Sunday, July 12th, dawned sullen and hot, without a breath of wind. With every shop and office closed until Monday, people began drifting out of the stifling tenements and into taverns and began to drink and talk. With almost every able-bodied soldier in the area still at Gettysburg, the city's small police force had no reinforcements. But there was still no cause for alarm. Sometime after midnight, the mood changed. Towards dawn, disturbing reports began filtering into police headquarters on Mulberry Street of gangs of angry, drunken men roaming the streets. Not long after sunrise, on Monday, July 13th, 1863, waves of angry Irishmen began spilling out of the Lower East Side, moving west across Broadway and heading uptown towards the draft office, armed with iron bars, brickbats, and bludgeons, and growing all the time. At 8.30 a.m., an urgent dispatch went out from police headquarters. Trouble brewing. Telegraph lines cut. Rush large force. The mob was composed of the lowest and most degraded of the foreign population, mainly Irish, raked from the filthy cellars and dens of the city, calling at places where large bodies of men were at work and pressing them in. Their numbers rapidly increased to thousands. It was a strangely weaponed, ragged, coatless army as it heaved tumultuously toward Third Avenue, a telegraph operator named Charles Chapin remembered. By nine o'clock, the mob had grown to 5,000. By the time it reached the draft office, it had swelled to 15,000. And then the violence began. The enraged mob beat through the scanty police guard smashed and burned the draft office, then turned their fury on a detachment of 32 militiamen, beating and kicking one soldier to death, then turning on another. The mob grabbed him and, taking him to the top of the rocks, stripped his uniform of him. And after beating him almost to a jelly, threw him over a precipice some 20 feet high on the hard rocks beneath the New York Tribune. By 11.30, the federal draft had been officially suspended in New York, and the city itself was in a state of siege. The 
the scene on Third Avenue at this time was appalling. It was now noon, but the hot July sun was obscured by heavy clouds, which cast dark shadows over the city. As one glanced among the dense mass of men and women, the eye rested upon huge columns of smoke rising from burning buildings, for the mob had now begun to plunder and burn, giving a wild and terrifying aspect to the scene. Charles Chapin. They also, they cut the telegraph bars, like Indians did out west when they had to cut the communication system. And the reason that this rising can take place is because there's no army here. The army has, and, and in fact, a good deal of the local militia are off fighting Gettysburg. Now, Gettysburg is over, but Lee's army is wounded and dangerous and in the area and, and could, in fact, perhaps make an end run and, you know, attack Washington, attack New York. So they're kind of pinned down there for a while. So they have the opportunity of no military uh, 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 presence and, um, uh, and they explode onto the streets. The draft riots represent the closest that New York City ever got to a revolution. It was just a sort of explosion of blind rage. There's no doubt that the biggest, most fundamental cause were, you know, massive masses of immigrants, many of them Irish, who'd come to the United States with the promise of leading kind of a good life and had found that promise vacated. Um, we're living in misery, we're living in shacks. All day, marauding mobs of infuriated immigrants rampaged up and down the island at will, destroying streetcars and train tracks, looting and burning the armory on 21st Street, the Harlem Temperance Room, the Magdalene Asylum for Aged Prostitutes, and Brooks Brothers on Fifth Avenue, as well as the homes of police officials and prominent Republicans and politicians of any kind, and the rich. The riot over the next three days, it's the largest incident of civil disorder in the history of the United States. The crowds do uh, a couple of things. One, they go after those that they think are the agents of this war. They go after the New York Times. Huge crowds surge down and try to attack the Times building. And uh, Leonard Jerome, one of the owners, uh, is up on the roof with Gatling guns, you know, sort of trained on the crowd. They, you know, head for Wall Street, although Wall Street is the most vigorously defended of all. There are naval gunboats that are brought up to train on the crowd, and hot oil is being prepared uh, by, you know, employees up on the roof. But they go after individual rich people, you know, and because class divisions are played out on the streets sartorially, they'll say, there goes a $300 man, and they'll mob them. Or they'll go to Gramercy Park and try and sort of smash up the homes. So they attack upwards and they also attack downwards. Because on the one hand, they hold blacks responsible in some sense for this, because you know if there hadn't been blacks, there hadn't been slaves, there wouldn't be any of this stuff. That's what it was about. Just pure racial hatred and fear. And then those who have kept people of African descent down for so long uh, begin to believe the lies that somehow we are different from the rest of humanity. Somehow we don't deserve our equal rights. Somehow we deserve to be abused and mistreated. And then they act out on that in the most vicious and brutal of ways. At 2.30, a mob of immigrants screaming, burn the nigger's nest, surrounded the colored orphan asylum at Fifth Avenue and 43rd Street, home to more than 200 African-American children under the age of 12. All of the terrified children managed to escape out a back door, the older ones carrying the younger ones on their backs. Before the mob broke in, hacked apart furniture and toys with axes, then set the building on fire. A 10-year-old girl was killed on the street outside when a dresser heaved from a window struck her in the head. Well, the extent to which the black population had become the symbols of everyone's anger in this war is really seen in the destruction of the Colored Orphan Asylum. This is probably the most offenseless group of people in the city at the time. But a mob walks up to the asylum, 
tortures it and is attempting to kill the inhabitants. A police guard has to escort the children with their little bags and satchels of clothes tossed across their shoulders through the streets of Manhattan. The police and the soldiers are carrying rifles with bayonets on them to keep the crowds back. They have to put these children on a barge and carry them out to the middle of the East River where no one can get to them, where they remain for a day or two before they go on to Long Island to safety. July 13th, 1863. The colored half orphan asylum on Fifth Avenue is burned. Tribune office to be burned tonight. If a quarter of what one hears be true, this is an organized insurrection in the interests of the rebellion, and Jefferson Davis rules New York today. George Templeton Strong. By the end of the first day of rioting, the wealthiest and most important city in the nation lay in a state of anarchy all but complete. As darkness fell, an infernal pall of smoke shrouded New York. Towards midnight, stabs of lightning and lashing sheets of rain broke over the town. If the devil would appear before me now, if I could just stand for an hour on the streets of New York during the draft riots and see what this was like, this explosion, which I think in to large measure would define the city for, for generations afterwards and would stay in the recesses of the memory. What did the city smell like and look like at that moment? That's the moment I would like to see. Stand on a rooftop and look down. No sleep. The sultriness pervades the air and binds the brain a dense oppression. All is hushed nearby. Yet fitfully from far breaks a mix surf of muffled sound, the atheist roar of riot. The town is taken by its rats, ship rats, and rats of the wharves. And man rebounds whole eons back in nature. Herman Melville was watching this uh, from a rooftop and he said, the rats have taken the city. And to the degree that you're beginning to think about the dangerous classes, and now here it is, judgment day has come and they've exploded uh, onto the streets. The worst fantasies that you can imagine uh, are actually being enacted. You look at the riots in Los Angeles, or you look at the Gordon riots in London in the 1780s, or you look at the Paris Commune, there's only one mob in history. All mobs do the same things. There's a reptilian brain buried in the human brain. And when people lose their individuality in mobs, they do things like this. And the draft riot mobs were no different from any other mob. They were capable of really extraordinary hideous violence against people. On Tuesday, the atrocities against African Americans grew worse. On 8th Avenue, a mob of 5,000 men went house to house, searching for black families and interracial couples to hang and burn. On Wednesday, the hottest day of the year, a black shoemaker named James Costello was beaten, kicked, stoned, trampled, and then hanged. A few hours later, a mob of Irish laborers pulled a crippled 22-year-old black coachman named Abraham Franklin from his lodging house. He was tortured, lynched, burned and mutilated, then dragged through the streets by his genitals. His body parts are then fetished. The crowd begins to chop pieces of his body up um, and carry them about as souvenirs. Um, and that's not necessarily the most extraordinarily violent episode that happens in this week of violence. Blacks were chased to the docks, thrown into the river, and drowned. While some, after being murdered, were hung to lampposts. Between 40 and 50 colored persons were killed and nearly as many maimed for life. Around 10 o'clock on Wednesday night, 
after three full days of anarchy and violence, the first Union reinforcements, the 65th New York Regiment, finally began arriving by ferry from Gettysburg. The 7th New York Regiment arrived the next morning, and the tide of battle turned. There are nothing less than pitched battles in the streets, and you know they attack the barricades, there are Gatling guns set up, all the machinery of high-tech warfare that we associate with the Civil War is being played out uh, 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 here on the streets. But once the military power was fully brought to bear, it took several days, but in fact, the resistance was crushed. We soon cleared the streets and then commenced searching the houses, killing those within that resisted and took the remainder prisoners. Some of them fought like incarnate fiends and would not surrender. All such were shot on the spot. The fight lasted about 40 minutes. The mob being entirely dispersed, we returned to headquarters. Captain H.R. Putnam. Like the police, the exhausted, sunburnt troops were almost all local boys, many from Irish and German families themselves, with strict orders to disperse the immigrant mob, and if necessary, to shoot to kill. There was a question, I think, of the loyalty of Irish police. What will they do with their own? I think that was a question in the minds of the upper classes. Can they be trusted to put these mobs down? And as it turned out, it was the Irish cop who did his job and fought the mobs. And uh, some of them lost their lives doing it. By Friday, New York had been completely occupied by federal troops, and calm had been restored. But the city lay shattered. Hundreds of buildings had been burned or demolished, and $5 million in property had been destroyed. The loss of life had been appalling. No one would ever know for sure, but at least 119 people had been killed in the draft riots, including 18 African Americans, 16 soldiers, and 85 rioters, most of them Irish. The number of killed will never be known because bodies were thrown in the river or buried in secret, but we do have enough of the uh, crude outlines of that conflict to know that there's never been anything like it in the history of the United States. A gloom of infamy and shame will hang over New York for centuries. Over 3,000 are today homeless and destitute, without means of support for their families. It is truly a day of distress to our race. The Irish have become so brutish that it is unsafe for families to live near them. And while I write, there are many now in the stations and country hiding from violence. The Christian Recorder. Nothing delights us more greatly as to hear of Yankees burning, destroying, and killing Yankee buildings, Yankee property, and Yankee men. The Charleston Daily Courier. I think one of the great comments on the draft riots comes oddly from Walt Whitman, who during the war is in the South in Washington, D.C., and who writes a letter back to his mother saying that feelings are hot as fire against New York City right now because the whole country is being tortured. So how can New York express its problems violently against the government and against the black population? when no one is doing well under these circumstances. It had been, Walt Whitman wrote, the devil's own work all through. And in an anguished letter home, he struggled to make sense of what had happened to his city and his people. So the mob has arisen at last in New York. It seems the passions of the people were only sleeping and burst forth with a terrible fury. I do not feel it in my heart to abuse the poor people or call for ropes or bullets for them. We are in the midst of strange and terrible times. One is pulled a dozen different ways in his mind and hardly knows what to think or do. Walt Whitman. It would take decades, generations, for Americans to come to terms with what had happened on the streets of New York. 
In some ways, it is a culmination of the economic transformation of the city. The foundations of the industrial New York that would be the New York that would last into the 20th century were being laid. And I think that uh, there was lots of tension and conflict in that. So it's a, it's a political crisis. It's a racial crisis. It's a class crisis. Uh, it is a simple crisis of fairness and justice. And you have this conflict start, which still continues in America, between people coming to the cities from, from inside the country, African Americans, and people coming from outside and that there's this conflict there between African Americans and immigrants, which will survive to this day. Who's gonna be at the bottom in New York? And what America has always decided in the end is that race is more important than anything else. That's who will stay at the bottom. In the months to come, some efforts were made to make restitution to the city's black population. But it was too little, too late. August 24th. 1863. Relief and damage money is well enough, but it cannot atone fully for the evils done by riots. It cannot bring back our murdered dead. It cannot remove the insults we feel, and it gives us no proof that the people have really changed their minds for the better towards us. Dr. J.W.C. Peddington. In increasing numbers, African Americans left New York. As late as 1900, fewer than 60,000 African Americans made their home in Manhattan, out of a population of almost two million. If you want to date the metropolis of New York, you can date it from the draft riots. It was a defining moment in the city. It had a world-class riot. That's a mark of a world-class city. I mean, Paris, London have had tremendous social explosions, and New York became a world-class city with a world-class riot. This was, in a way, in an ironic way, it was a mark of the city's arrival, I think, on the, on the world stage, that you could have violence on this scale. I think that the draft riots uh, uh, really uh, provide a kind of wake-up call um, for the elite and middle class of New York, uh, because it is a demonstration of, uh, in the phrase of the day, the volcano under the city. It was a demonstration of the enormous number of poor, desperate, angry people who were there and who represented a threat to the city. The draft riots marked a crucial turning point in the history of New York City. In the decades to come, New Yorkers would begin to enlarge their sense of what a city should be. It was a struggle that would take generations to achieve and never really end but it had begun. Within months, the first modern fire department had been organized, and the police department greatly expanded. New forms of public transportation would soon begin to ease the tremendous congestion in lower Manhattan. And by 1866, a metropolitan board of health had been formed, the first of its kind in the country, as doctors plunged into the slums to assess the sanitary conditions of the poor. Their findings shocked New Yorkers and forced the city to pass the first laws regulating housing in the United States. It is shameful, George Templeton Strong wrote, that men, women, and children should be permitted to live in such holes. What's important about the 1867 law is that it establishes the principle for really the first time in American history that government in general has the right to establish some minimal standards of livability and safety and quality. And there were other consequences of the riots, even more momentous. In 1863, the year of the uprising, an ex-fireman from the Five Points named William M. Tweed was named Grand Sachem of Tammany Hall. One of his first acts was to push through a special low interest loan program that enabled poor New Yorkers as well as rich to buy their way out of the draft. In the decades to come, New York's immigrant poor would begin to acquire a voice in urban politics for the first time. The draft riots, which the Irish were fundamental players in, in 1863, uh, were horrible. 
there was the behavior was unspeakable in some cases, some parts of it. But when they were over, people knew that there was no way to deal with political power in New York City without finding out how to deal with the Irish. And I'm not saying that violence is the way to get people to respect you, but by 1870, they ran Tammany Hall. At 7.30 on the morning of Saturday, April 15th, 1865, church bells began tolling all over Brooklyn and New York. The morning papers carried staggering news. President Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated the night before. On Portland Avenue in Brooklyn, Walt Whitman and his mother silently passed the morning papers back and forth, too stunned to eat or talk. Late in the afternoon, Whitman took the ferry to Manhattan and walked up Broadway under a darkening sky. The normally bustling thoroughfare was eerily quiet. The storefronts shuttered and hung with black. Here and there, people huddled in doorways to escape the steady rain. Saturday, April 15th, 1865. Black clouds driving overhead. Lincoln's death. Black, black, black. As you look toward the sky, long, broad, black, like great serpents undulating in every direction. Walt Whitman. Ten days later, a funeral train brought Lincoln's body to New York on its way home to Illinois. Hundreds of thousands of grieving New Yorkers silently lined the streets of Manhattan as the president's body was borne slowly down Broadway towards City Hall. African Americans were barred from the ceremonies at first, then at the last minute allowed to march, but only at the very end of the parade. Scalpers sold choice positions along the route for $8 a piece. From the second floor of his family's house on East 28th Street, seven-year-old Theodore Roosevelt and his brother looked on. Parties for the moment do not exist. While all men of whatever religious faith, of whatever political creed, are united perhaps for the first time in the history of the Republic, in love for the departed, in sympathy for the bereaved. Touching evidence of the firm seat occupied in the popular heart by the lamented president is the almost universal exhibition by the poor, the very poor people of this city and the adjoining city of Brooklyn, the New York Times. Lincoln's death brought New Yorkers together as nothing else had. But in the restless, turbulent decades to come, as the city led America into a new age, crucial questions remained. Would it be possible to bridge the enormous chasms still dividing Americans and make the Union an enduring reality? Visit New York online. Jump into a taxi and play a quiz game. Visit a virtual New York. And for teachers and parents, take your kids on a learning adventure through your town. PBS Online at pbs.org.